Dun, 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 dun. All right, here we are, episode 62 of Merriweather's World. I am your host, Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderbruggen, creator of the Foraging Texas website, author of Idiot's Guide Foraging, co-creator of the Wazoo Foraging Bandana, Whoa. and lots of other stuff. Um, you know, articles in Charm Magazine, patents, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you're not here to learn about me. You are here to learn about plants. So tonight, it's going to be awesome. We are going to start a two-episode uh, thing, maybe even more, two-episode thing on elderberry. Tonight, we'll be discussing identification and mimics. And then next week, we will be talking about the chemistry and how to use it. Hey, Terry. Hey, Rhonda. Hey, Deborah. People are showing up. Hey, Matthew. Good to hear you like my teaching. Awesome. Terry, how is it going? I got to say, it was one of those days where uh, only extreme amounts of willpower kept me from smashing my computer center or my computer systems. Uh, I got to tell you, talking about ancient plants with crappy computers can be frustrating. Hey, Nick, uh, I'm actually thinking, oops, sorry, I got a niche. Uh, it might be better to downgrade my computer and then rebuild it rather than anything else. Hey, Donna. Hey, Sherry. Hey, Dion. Oh, cool. Lots of people here. Okay. As usual, uh, starting off with a little bit of housekeeping. So let me throw up first links to my website and upcoming classes. And by classes, I actually mean singular, not plural. Uh, oops, I guess I have to hit return there. Uh, the next public, why are you doing? Okay, there we go. The next public class will be June 20th. So a little ways out at Deer Lake uh, Spa and Lodge Resort up in Montgomery, Texas. This is an absolutely amazing place uh, if you ever want your chakra realigned and your innards cleaned out and, you know, amazing detoxification type stuff, this is the place to go. And, or you can just go there and spend four hours with me learning about all the wild edible plants. So there's that. Uh, also, let me just put up uh, a link to my book and to my Amazon page, because that's one of the main things that I use to keep this going. I will say, just a minute, I need my book, it's on the floor. Uh, the way the Idiot's Guide works is they find an idiot to write a book, in this case, Mark Merriweather Vorderbruggen, PhD. I do not get any royalties if you just buy this book willy-nilly. If you use the very specific link I posted, then I get 74 cents from Amazon. So that's a good thing. Hey, Tribe. Hey, Ruthie. Good to see you. Hey, Terry, freezing up. Uh, I am running on an Ethernet cable. I'm also running on a seven-year-old computer because that's what I got. Um, trying really hard to keep it all together here. But uh, yeah, so if you're going to buy the book, buy it from the link I just posted. Otherwise, I get nothing. Well, okay, my head gets a little bit bigger. But that's about it. Hey, Emma, Emma, Emma. Hey, that was a great picture of you, Emma, uh, yesterday or two days ago. Actually, I think this is your profile picture now. Yeah. Okay. So there's that. There's the book. A few other things. Let me just throw this up here. Do, do, do. If you want your very own Fording Texas t-shirt. Whoa. Uh, you can get it from Cafe Press. Uh, Cool. There's also a few other things, some bags and water bottles there. You can show your 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 pride. Um, but of course, probably what you really want. Hey, Mark, good to hear you got the book. Hopefully you got it via Amazon. Uh, what you probably all really don't, you know, if you don't have it, you really need one of these bandanas. I will say Food grade ink, super durable. I've had one that I washed 18 times and it looks as good as this brand new one. Um, 12 common uh, edible and or medicinal plants with all sorts of information for each one. Uh, you know, like what to eat. If you see here, 
on the center, there's kind of icons. Is it first aid? Uh, is it a good tinder? Is it a good uh, grain? Uh, vitamin C, do not eat this part, things like that. Vitamin C, and then each plant has the assorted symbols associated with it. So really, really useful. We've had people go over in Europe and find a bunch of the plants on it too. So always cool. Hey, Joe. Hey, Donald. Hey, Debbie from Livingston. Cool. Okay, so Forging Bandana, uh, another great sponsor, and I actually don't have any of their bottles with me. I'm sorry, Kenneth. Uncommon Bees, and don't forget, uh, oh, you know what? I think that should be 15. Oops, maybe too late. Okay, so Uncommon Bees, if you use the coupon Forking Weeds, you get a big discount now until midnight tonight. That being said, the 25% uh, thing there, that might be too big. That was a special promotion from earlier. Uh, so I think it's only 15. Wait, what's this? Okay, we got a question from Tina. Question, I purchased two elderberry plants from Cuttings and uh, Salado in October 2018. The plants have grown well the past year and a half, flowering double this year, uh, flowering double this year that they did last year. Problem is, last year, once the flowers fell off, all, no berries formed. The stems shriveled up and died off. Okay. A um, couple of things that lead to that problem, Tina. One, not enough pollination. So we need something. You need to plant some other types of flowers um, that bloom before the elderberry to start getting bees used to coming to your yard. And then also maybe a little bit more water. So give that a try. Hey, hey, David, how are you doing? Oh, okay. Uncommon Bees would like to announce that the 25% off is still going on. Off, on, off, on. But yeah, so use the Forking Weeds coupon code. Anything you buy from Uncommon Bees, 25% off. Awesome. Okay. Uh, another great thing, if you are looking for different herbs, then you got to go to Plant Medicine is the Best Medicine. Ricardo Shilly Shally, he's probably going to be here tonight. Uh, his herb shop, Herbs, up in East Texas. Uh, talk to him. And one of the great things about him is if you're not sure what exactly you need, he'll set up like a Zoom conference and discuss things with you and try and figure out what uh, would be best for your situation. Very, very, very cool. So did that? Okay, yes. Yeah, so you so got the coupon uh, code there. Another thing. I got to say, those of you who are into bushcraft, hiking, and all that sort of thing, got to check out Camp Craft Outdoors. They have American-made, super-quality gear, uh, heavy-duty, heavy-duty, but lightweight. Uh, if you like canvas and wax canvas, durable, if you are going off the trail and don't want to wear a big turtle shell of plastic and nylon, on your back, if you want to go into nature with natural products, Campcraft uh, Outdoors, definitely the people to check out. Okay, but wait, there's more. Another person I got to shout out, another great sponsor that uh, helps with all this. So where to go? Where to go? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So Fear and Dread in Vidor, Texas. Shout out to them. If you are looking for sort of preparedness, survival, firearm type stuff, definitely check them out. They got great deals. Like uh, one of the things I got from them uh, that I actually bought because I wanted it, but it was such a great price that I went with them other than Amazon or other things, was this vacuum-packed emergency trauma kit. Uh, so I keep these in my car and around the house. And just, just in case you come across something that requires a tourniquet or a sucking chest wound patch or things like that. Um, so any sort of survival gear, definitely the place to check out there in Vidor, Texas, keeping it in Texas. Okay. Enough of that. Just a quick scan through here. Do, do, do. Okay. It looks like, uh, no questions at this time. So let's jump into why we are here. Elderberries. Elderberries, elderberries, elderberries. Yes, your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries, but that's okay because elderberries are a great thing. Let's talk elderberries. First off, why are we even talking about elderberries? Well, elderberries are probably one of the most ancient and powerful plants 
when it comes to maintaining and strengthening the, um, excuse me, the immune system. So they have a bunch of different compounds that work in a diverse number of ways that really help prevent humans from getting sick or help fight sickness. Now, that being said, the FDA does not condone or uh, approve of the following statements, blah, blah, blah. So the FDA uh, does not necessarily agree with this. And so I have to put that disclaimer there, uh, but something to keep in mind. Hey, hey, Chris, on the ground right now. Uh, wow, Nicole. Uh, okay, so actually Nicole is mentioning here in the comment. Let me put this up if you don't mind. Uh, 15 years ago, before all the great resources available, she eagerly made her family elderberry syrup, which actually turned out to be pokeweed. Uh, yeah, really, really dangerous. Thankfully, the pokeweed berry juice is, um, as far as a pokeweed goes, one of the less issue, less poisonous issues out there. Okay. Um, so, and actually pokeweed is one of the mimics we'll be talking about tonight, but tonight we're going to talk Dun, dun, dun. Can I do this? All right. Elderberry or Zambucus niger identification and mimics. So like I said, tonight we'll be talking about how to identify this wonderful plant that's found all over North America, uh, Europe, and even into Russia. So how to identify it and then what common mimics you should avoid or and, and how to tell them apart, obviously. Mm hmm Okay. Uh, okay. Quick question from Jessica. Elderberries are too tall to reach. Can I top them when the berries are ripe and not stun the plant? Yeah. Um, elderberries, the, the plants are very durable. You can whack them back and they will continue to grow. They grow by runners under the ground. Um, it's actually recommended once a year to thin out your elderberry thicket. Okay. So what happens if I do this? Oh, cool. Okay. It worked. So overview, what we're going to talk about over the next two weeks, like I said, is identification uh, and location. And then the mimics will be what we'll talk about tonight. And then next year will be how to use it in the chemistry. So starting with the identification. Okay, let's ask, do you want me in the side here? Or do you want just big picture? Uh, big picture, which actually isn't all that much bigger, is it? Okay, I guess there's room for me and elderberry. So identification, the elderberry, the way you find it, it is a small tree, like I said, that grows in a multiple thicket. So there'll be a bunch of these, these trunks coming up. None of them are really going to be much thicker than an inch and a half uh, in diameter. So, you know, they're, they're fairly small trunks. Uh, the roots are connected. So if you were to just to grab one and pull really hard, you would probably be able to pull the elderberry out of the ground. And what would you would see was a thick rhizome, again, eh, maybe about as thick as my finger, that runs out and connects to other trunks. So, you know, fairly narrow diameter, let's see here, fairly narrow, like inch, inch and a half diameter trunks connected to each other by thick rhizomes. Hey, Julie, you on the side. Okay, okay. People seem to like me, so we'll, we'll stay here. Oh, and tonight, of course, I'm drinking Texas gin from the Real uh, Spirits Company, the gin that I helped develop. So we'll see how the night goes. Okay, so small tree in a thicket. Roots are connected from this time of year on. You'll usually see these flowers, and we're going to get a lot more pictures here. So let's move on to uh, looking at the different parts. Okay, so the stem itself. You can see here on the left-hand side a picture of the stem with a ruler next to it. The has a woody, bumpy surface, somewhat cracked, uh, with little black spots on it. If you were to cut it in half, like if you were just to cut through the stem here, and is that showing up? Yeah, okay. So if you were to cut through that, um, you would actually see instead of solid wood, like a you know a normal tree at that size would just be wood across the top, it would actually have a kind of a thick crust 
And then the inner, you know, at least half of the inner would be more of a white pithy sort of material that's easy to clean out. So uh, one of the things that the, the stems were used for was to make pipes, to make uh, either for like blowing on fire to you know, direct oxygen to a specific, specific place to get the fire growing more or to uh, you know, smoke through. Um, I'm going to take a second. Can I yell to Mrs. Weather, uh, to Minnie Weather? <laughs> Would you mind running outside and snipping off some elderberry branches to bring in here? Uh, finger thickness with leaves and flowers, please. All right. I meant to do this before the, the class, but I was fighting with my computer. Okay. Uh, texting on Facebook and casting on YouTube. All right. Sorry, it's leggy. Um, okay. So you cut through the stem. It's not solid wood. It's a, a kind of a thick rind with then white, easy to remove pith from inside. Now, as you move up the tree to the newer growth, you will see that the newer growth is going to be much more green in color, especially in the spring. Ooh, did that get bigger? And then as it matures, it starts taking on a reddish color. And then the stems of the flower, I'm sorry, the stems of the leaves and the flowers actually both become a purple red in color. So this, this, the picture here of of the of the trunk that is the prime thing you are looking for to help you identify the elderberry that kind of gray light gray stem mature stem with the little dark bumps and assorted cracks through the bark then up higher you get the green and the reddish thing going on okay uh ruthie do the stems always turn brown or do they stay red so the, the, the stems, the, the mature stems will stay. Oh, perfect. There's two. Okay. Oh, lots of flowers. I'm going to set them right here for a second. Okay. So the mature stems are going to stay this light gray with the dark speckles. And then as you move up the trunk, or is it, yeah, you move up the trunk in the spring, the new growth will be green. And then by late spring into summer that, or sorry, yeah, that green, of the new branches starts turning red. And then by the end of the, the year, uh, and certainly the next year, this year's growth will have started to turn brown. Okay, so is that making sense? And then like I said, that has that white pithy center. And does any, oh, let's see. Good. I don't know if you can see there. But you have the green part, and then that white part is easily hollowed out. So it's just uh, kind of the pithy center. So it's really easy to hollow this twig out. Uh, I don't know if you can see. Maybe it'll focus here. The green will. So this is the, this year's growth, the green yet. It does have little brown specks on it and a spider, which I'll eat later. Um, but yeah, the 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 bumps. Uh, hopefully, it can focus on that. That speckled bumps are kind of a indicator all up and down the elderberry. Okay, set that down there. Uh, can you enlarge your picture now? I think this is. Oh wait, you know what? Can I do something on this side? Is there a? Well, if I enter full screen. No, this is, this is as big as it gets. Uh, like I said, even if I move move to there. Let me, let me try this. Oh, you know what? Here, let me try this. So there's the stem, some new stem. Oops. And there is the pithy center. Okay. Let's jump back to the presentation. Okay, so that's the stem. Really good source of uh, having you identify it. Now let's talk about the leaves. Uh, 
And this is something that always confuses people, how to tell the difference between a simple leaf where you just have you know, one leaf and a compound leaf where you have a stem with a bunch of leaflets coming off it. Hey, good morning, Case. So when it comes down to it, it de really depends on, think of the fall or whenever the leaf drops. So let's say in the fall, when the leaves start dropping, do, let me pull one off here. And I'm going to switch back to me here for a second. Now, so what we have here is a compound leaf. So in the fall, if you can see this, if each leaf just falls off like this, that is a simple leaf. A compound leaf is where this whole section falls off. Where So a thing with multiple leaflets all fall off as one unit. So kind of, if you're really not sure, you, you kind of have to wait until fall to see what you're looking at. But you'll have to work with me here. The leaves of the elderberry are compound. Nope, you're still seeing, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, let's do this again. So if each leaf like this falls off, that is compound, but if they fall off in groups like this, that is compound. Whoops. So, sorry. Simple compound. I'm just having fun now. Okay. So, in the case of the elderberry, it is a compound leaf, and I just happen to tear one of the leaflets off. You will see the leaflets themselves i got to hold that one up back on there. They are opposite each other, and they have an odd number. So they'll end with one at the peak here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sometimes there will just be five. Uh, new growth might only be three, but it will be an odd number of leaflets on the compound leaf. The structure of each leaflet, the vein pattern, and maybe you can see it better on the back here, eh, front back, so is what we call pinnate, pinnate veins. So pinnate has one center vein, and then all the other veins come off it. So if you think if you flipped it over, it'd kind of look like a Christmas tree, but one center vein, and then all the other veins come off it, like a candelabra or a menorah or a pine tree or something like that. So the individual uh, veins or the, the leaflets, the individual leaflets have a pinnate vein structure. That's another thing you need to look at when you're identifying it. Now, if I can get it really close, I don't know if you can see it or not. Maybe if I put my finger up. It's kind of hard to see. But if you look here, let me put the picture up again. And maybe here, I don't know if you can or not, but along the edge, the edge of each leaf, leaflet is uh, dentata or teeth. So kind of rounded bump teeth there. So you might have to zoom in on your screen or something like that. But the edges of the elderberry leaflets have a very tiny bumpiness to them. I don't know if you can see it or not. You can kind of see it, especially right below the Foraging Texas blue, red, and white sign there. But uh, if I can get closer, yeah. But bumpy edges. Not lobed, not sharp teeth, not little sharp teeth, not big sharp teeth. Very small, rounded, bumpy teeth. Okay. And like I mentioned, where did the, I'll just tear another leaf off here. Odd number with the leaves opposite each other, except for the final peak one. So very important. That is the leaf structure. Now, when we talk about the mimics, I'll go through and have pictures of the mimics and so forth to help you understand those. Okay, so going back to the picture. Everything good there? Looks like people, hey, good morning, or good <laughs> good evening, John Mark. I, I, I get the donut shop crew mixed up with the Meriwether's World crew. That's okay. 
because really it should be the same crew. Okay, next up, the flowers. So in the spring, all summer long, and even through the fall, we will get what's called white umbels of flowers. If you think like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring me back here for this. So, oops, come back. If you think like a rounded umbrella shape, that is the shape of the cluster of flowers. Like I said, they bloom white spring through fall. It's very likely as you move into summer, you will have berries and flowers on the same tree. So the flowers themselves are very closely packed together and they have short stems. So I actually have some here. So let me pull this up. And I apologize for the little shakiness. So you can see the, the leaves are fairly uniformly close together. Here's that umbral shape that we were talking about. Like I said, to me, it looks like cauliflower. And let me just pinch one of these off here for a second. So, again, fairly even distribution. If we turn it around, I'm trying to, I don't know if you can see, or maybe I can get closer this way. But the stems attaching the flowers to the bigger stems are quite short. So very, very short stems. So kind of long from here to the cluster of the flowers, but then the, you know, maybe if I just pull one of these off. Can I hold it? Will it focus? I don't know if it'll focus. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it won't focus. I'm sorry. But the, the stems that actually attach to the flowers themselves to the rest of the stems are very short. This comes into play later when you're looking at other things. Uh, okay, so like I said, the, the flower clusters, a white umbrella shape. The flower is very closely packed together. And then the connecting stem between the small white flowers and the larger main stem is fairly short. Yeah, I need to get my face out of here. Maybe that would help. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, not really. All right. Um, but if you go to foragingtexas.com, you can actually see all these pictures uh, and, and close up and everything there too. Okay, so any questions about the flowers? Yeah, smell of vision would be cool. If not, let us go back and move on to the berries. And unfortunately, I don't have any berries to show right now. Let me bring this here. So the berries themselves are very, very, very small, like less than a quarter inch, um, smaller than popcorn, really. They'll start green and then turn darker and darker and darker. Uh, ooh, maybe holding white paper behind. Mm, uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm, just, I'm just curious. We'll try it, but I wonder if... Now, I, I, unfortunately, I can't like hold the white paper. Now, nah, never mind. Okay. Now, nah, thanks. All right. So let's go back. Ooh, there's bugs. Okay. So the berries themselves, very, very, very small. But for every flower that formed, you get a berry. Hopefully, if you know, if you don't have cold weather, and if you do get enough moisture, and you do get enough pollinators. Because uh, if you don't have the pollinators, the fruit isn't going to form. So that's why I mentioned earlier, you want to uh, make sure your yard has other flowers that bloom before the elderberry so that the bees are already accustomed to coming in. Ah, Charles, more gin. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do what, uh, what Charles said. Mm. <laughs> Some of the plant stuff have been falling into my gin. 
Yeah, Ali, thank you. Yeah, the, the pictures on the website are much, much better for this sort of thing. You can go and study them later. Okay, the berries themselves uh, appear midsummer through the fall, uh, depending on how mild the winter it is, at least in the Houston area and areas farther south, they continue to form even through the winter. So uh, are the berries ever bigger or is that a mimic, Ruthie? Um, so there are mimics that have berries that are bigger, berries that are roughly the same size and no berries at all. Um, but I would say of the different mimics, the elderberry berries are definitely the smallest. The, uh, as we see, the pokeweed berries have a very distinctive shape. And then the uh, viburnum dentata, arrowwood, they also have a very distinctive color difference. Okay, quick thing about these berries. Uh, I'll talk more about them next week but you do not want to eat them raw. They have some cyanide compounds in them and they also have some other fairly unpleasant flavored molecules in the raw berries. But if you cook the berries or dry the berries, the uh, flavor goes away. Now, if you crush these berries in your fingers, I am crushing your head. I am crushing your head. Uh, they're going to stain purple. They're, they're a very juicy berry with some really itty bitty bitty tiny seeds. So almost imagine like crushing little tiny grapes would be a good example. Um, but again, the main thing, uh, oh, usually the weight of them will cause them to hang down. The original flowers will be kind of pointing upright, but the weight of the berries will actually bend the plant over. Um, I will also tell you that birds and other critters love the berries. So even if you have a good crop of berries, there's a good chance that they will be stripped before <laughs> you can get to them. Um, also, they really don't ripen well off the tree. So you need to wait really until they look like the pictures here and then harvest them. <laughs> hey, Kathleen, I wasn't sure if anyone would actually get the uh, that reference. Wade, safe to just ferment the raw berries or need to be cooked? Um, the fermentation process will get rid of the, the potential flavor and cyanide compounds, um, but ideally a little bit of, of heat will be beneficial. Ruthie, uh, actually mildly toxic, not deadly or anything like that, but quite a few people report uh, developing a very upset stomach if they eat uh, many of the berries. So you really don't want to eat the berries fresh. You do need to dry them, uh, cook them, ferment them, turn them into alcohol, anything like that before consuming them. Okay, any questions about the berries? Otherwise, oops, okay, moving on. Location. So we now know the basics of what the plant looks like. Um, let's talk about where you find it. And Deanna, just a quick note. Um, I will be talking about that next week when, uh, let me just throw this up here. Um, this is cool. Oop, did it show? Okay. Uh, Deanna wants to mention, have you talked about people with autoimmune? Like I said, that will mainly be next week, but I will just say because of the enhancing and strengthening uh, effects that elderberry flowers and elderberry berries have on the immune system. If you have an autoimmune disease, it can actually make it worse. So yeah, that sucks. Okay. But yeah, we'll go more into that. Okay. So where are they found? The main thing is they are a full sun plant. They can handle some shade, but really they grow the best with the uh, uh, with full sunlight. They are a fast growing plant. They need a lot of carbon dioxide. They need a lot of uh, synthesis. So they need a lot of sunlight to grow all the stems and the leaves and the trunks and the berries and the flowers. So very, 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 very fast growing plant. So full sun is where it's going to have the best and you'll also get the best 
berries with the highest concentrations of the chemicals in the sun. So that being said, they also need a lot of water for the same reasons. If they're a fast growing plant, the water is used in you know all sorts of chemical processes of making all the sugars and all the other cellulose and everything that goes into it. Oh yeah, it <laughs> should be stream bank. Uh, sorry, yeah, I'm not gonna change it now. So yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> so um, stream bank, so along the edges of water, uh, pond edges, wet ditches, uh, in particular ditches that have water in them more often than not. So they don't want to be in the water, but they want to be right next to the water and sucking the moisture out. Uh, will you have on how to make the uh, cider, uh, the elderflower champagne? Um, not this week, not next week, but because I have so many flowers, we might do a live show. Um, so that would be cool. Maybe maybe we'll chalk that up, Carol. Okay, so uh, places they're not found. Uh, you are not going to find them in deep, shady woods, even if the woods are more swampy or things like that. Um, the closest you will find them in woods is along the borders uh, of clearings and at the edges of the woods. And then if you look really closely, um, I have the USDA map, Texas County breakdown of where the U.S. government claims you can find elderberry. That being said, the U.S. government is often wrong in these sort of things, but it, use it as a uh, potential indicator. One thing I found with these maps is if uh, the county next to you is indicated that it has a particular plant, there's a good chance that it may have spread to your county too, especially if the particular ecosystems are right. So like I said, in the case of elderberry, some moist areas, ditches that remain wet a lot, stock ponds, uh, things like that. There's a good chance you will find elderberry along them. And if you don't, they're really easy to transplant. Okay. Whew. Next, let's now move on to mimics. And we are going to start with a harmless mimic, actually really the only harmless mimic. If you mistake this particular plant, the arrowwood, for elderberry, uh, you're not going to run any problems. The, <laughs> sorry, I just saw, okay, let's just throw this up here. Yeah, so alcohol seems to be a popular theme in this group. It's a popular theme with me and then, you know, people who, uh, you know, are into that too gravitate to me. Uh, it's not just because I'm really big enough to have my own gravitational field. Okay, so arrowwood. Uh, this is a deep woods plant. It In the spring, it has flowers in an umbel that look damn near identical to elderberry. Really, really, really close. The main difference about the, the blooms, the cluster of blooms, is it's rarely bigger than about six inches across. Whereas with elderberry, you can have them a foot or more across, you know, the, the blooms, multiple blooms. So the arrowwood flower blooms approximately the same time in the, you know, starts blooming the same time in late winter, early spring, spring as the elderberry. Uh, it does form the same umbels. It has the small white flowers that are close packed. Uh, differences, it's a smaller, whoops. I'm, I'm doing hand signs here. It's a smaller cluster of flowers. So, you know, this would be arrowwood and this would be elderberry. Um, so that's one thing. And then go back here. Uh, another thing are the leaves themselves. The leaves of the arrowwood, they are actually simple leaves. If you watch this in the fall, each one of these leaves would separate from the stem separate from all the others. So each leaf is its own individual leaf. Not This is not one big leaflet like you would find on the uh, elderberry. Another thing is, okay, they are opposite each other along the branch. So kind of like elderberry, the, the leaves will be directly across from each other down the branch. 
They do have pinnate veins. So they have the center vein with the other veins coming off it. But then the edges are very different. The leaves themselves are wider. The arrowwood leaves are wider than the elderberry. They are shorter squatter and they have sharp teeth along the edge. So hopefully you can see the toothed edge of the arrowwood leaves in here. I don't know. See, actually, I guess it'd be this side. All right. Uh, good on the leaves. So simple leaves, pinnate. Uh, oh, and then the, the leaves on the branch. So usually you'll have a branch going off the main stem. Uh, it will be an even number of leaves on the branch because the flower actually grows right at the end of this branch. I don't know if you can see me circling it. Let me go back here. It's kind of hard to see, but this cluster of flowers here is at the end of this branch with all the leaflets on it. Whereas on elderberry, oops. oops. I want to do this one. Okay. You'll see there are the the leaves are separate from the branch. So if this was an arrow wood, there would be leaves running all the way up the stem right to the flowers themselves. Okay. Whew. Okay. So whoops, that's the flowers. We talked about the leaves. The main thing here: simple leaves with a very sharply toothed edge. The name of this is viburnum dentata, or the toothed viburnum. And so it has the sharp teeth on it. Okay, when the fruit appears, it'll still be in umbels. The fruit themselves are going to be a purple gray in color, so almost like a navy blue, as opposed to the dark, dark, dark purple of the elderberry. The berries will be just slightly bigger than the elderberries. The, the fruit is also going to be slightly oblong, so not a, a perfect sphere like the elderberry berries. Let me bring me up here. I'm, I'm, I'm doing hand motions. Whoops. Okay, so like the elderberry fruit will be round, whereas the... Yeah. The tooth viburnum fruit, fruit will be somewhat oblong. It's kind of hard to see in this picture. And then if you look at the bottom, if you can see it here, the bottom, like I'm circling one, you might have to zoom in. Uh, it actually has a little tiny crown on it or a little part that pokes up from the bottom of the fruit. So, and then there's going to be a lot less of them than there are of the elderberry. Yeah, they look kind of like blueberries, and actually they are in the same family uh, as the blueberries. Uh, I will tell you the berries of the arrowwood are pretty bland in flavor. They're not really, you know, good flavored like the blueberries are, but the blue color uh, in both blueberries and in the arrowwood has a lot of good helpful medicinal properties. Uh, especially in the area of antioxidants. And then it's kind of hard to see, but there, there's actually, they're a good source of wild yeast too. Oh yeah, and Tina, and huge seeds. And gin. Okay, so the fruit, pretty distinctive. Uh, navy blue rather than dark purple, somewhat larger, has that crown on the bottom. They are edible, but they have a very, very bland flavor. So that is arrowwood. That is the non-toxic mimic that a lot of people mistake for elderberry. Uh, in the spring, I get a lot of pictures from people who have found this in the deep woods. Uh, so let's talk about actually location here. There we go. So the arrowwood, this is a deep woods plant. It doesn't like sunlight. Um, it, it likes full shade, understory, deep wood sort of thing. If you see the Texas map, it's mainly kind of the East Texas area there. So it's very common in those counties and, and that area of the woods, big thickety sort of arrow uh, area. 
um, not so much where there's fewer trees and more sunlight. So yeah, uh, deep woods, shade, East Texas sort of thing. You're not going to run into it uh, out in like say Dallas unless someone planted it uh, as a landscape landscaping plant. Uh, Andrea, yes, you can make jelly out of the arrowwood. Um, it's fairly bland. Uh, a lot of times what people will do is use the arrowwood berries to increase the mass of other better flavored berries. Okay. Um, so that's arrowwood. Wow. Damn. Okay. This might be a three week uh, series, maybe even four weeks. Wow. Um, Chris Hamlin, helicopter guy. Uh, we might have to push you back and your work with elephant converse, uh, conservation uh, as much as a month because um, it's taken a while to get through here. Okay. Uh, without the flavor, air would be an alcohol, mainly because of the wild yeast, Kylie. Okay. So let's move on. Now let's get into a poisonous mimic and probably the most commonly mistaken bad plant for elderberry would be the water hemlock. So let's talk about that, especially since the, uh, the hemlock, okay, good, good, Chris. Uh, especially since the hemlock grows in a lot of the similar areas as elderberry. So you know, we got the little skull and crossbones up there. Do, do, do. Uh, yeah. So let's start with the flowers. Again, the flowers grow on umbels. They are very small white flowers. So the individual flowers look very, very similar to elderberry. But one of the distinguishing characteristics is they don't like each other. So remember that hemlock doesn't even like itself. All the flowers are going to be very widely spaced apart from each other. So you have the major stem running up from you know, the trunk of the tree. And then you have a really long secondary stem that keeps all the flowers apart from each other. And then if you look at the, the third layer stem, and it's, oh man, I wish you could see my mouse better. Um, the connection between the flower and itself to the, the stem is also very long. So what you get is very, very widely spaced flowers as opposed to the, oops, as opposed to the close packed flowers of the elderberry. So very widely spaced flowers. That's one of the key differences in the flowers. Now, later on, instead of forming berries, and I don't have a picture of them yet, but instead of forming berries, the uh, water, hemic, water hemlock forms seeds that look like carrot seeds or celery seeds or fennel seeds or dill seeds because it's in the same family as those plants. So it does not produce berries. It produces, you know, each flower turns into its own little seed. Okay, so those are the hemlock flowers. Next, and I, I, uh, just a reminder that uh, this video will be available on YouTube and on Facebook after this is over with. So if you need to go back and see parts, uh, you can go back and review the video there on YouTube or on the Forging Texas Facebook page. Okay, next up, the leaves of the water hemlock. Again, like elderberry, they are compound leaves. So this entire thing that I'm holding, that is one big leaf. And I got to do a shout out. Hey, Nick, if you're still here, notice the Wazoo survival uh, bracelet there on my wrist. Had to put that in there for you, Nick. Thanks for taking care of me. Uh, shout out to Wazoo survival because they are the ones that are paying for the StreamYard uh, system that I'm using to broadcast this and pop up the, the questions and put the pictures. So yay, Wazoo Survival. Okay, so uh, the leaves are what they call doubly compound because not only, I wish, I wish you could see this better, um, does it have leaflets coming off the main stem, 
but off the main stem of the flower, you have another stem, and off that, you have multiple leaflets. So it's doubly compound. It has a stem, and eat, uh, the stem has multiple stems coming off it with multiple leaflets on those secondary stems. Oops. Ah, go back, 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 back. Forward. Yeah, I need to figure out how to change the size of the mouse. I, yeah, I could do that in settings. Um, okay, so doubly compound leaf. Then if you look at an individual leaflet, I wish I could zoom in on this. The leaflets themselves are very sharply toothed, teethed, toothed, teethicated. <laughs> wow, did I just get a look. So remember the elderberry leaflet, very, very, very tiny bumps along the edge, whereas on the water hemlock, very sharp teeth. Arr, 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 arr. It wants to bite you. It wants to rip you. It wants to tear you. Uh, yeah, the Mac does allow me to change uh, size, but because of the crappiness and age of this computer, it would be like a four-minute process. So I should have done that. I will remember next week to enlarge the mouse to make it easier to see. Uh, but hopefully on these pictures, you know, is there a way to, no, I already tried. Um, zoom in closer. I think I need bigger pictures and smaller words. But again, the edge of the leaflets have sharp teeth. So keep that in mind. You know, hemlock is just a very unfriendly looking plant. The stem, the stem is another way of telling the difference between water hemlock and the elderberry. If you remember the elderberry, the mature was, was gray, light gray with dark brown bumps and cracks in it. And then it turned green. The younger part was green with little brown dots. Uh, in the case of the water hemlock, it is going to be a light green gray color with purple stripes or purple splotches. So you can see here uh, a close-up of the hemlock stem and one of the flower, or sorry, one of the uh, leaf stems uh, and another behind it. But a smooth surface, no bumps, no crags, nothing like that, no craps, uh, cracks. <laughs> uh, thinking about my computers. So... Um, just kind of a you know a solid stem. Now it is not a tree. The stem grows and dies in one year. So if you break it open, you'll you'll see it's actually hollow inside. It does not have the white pith that the elderberry has. And if you were to pull it out of the ground, it would just have a single taproot, kind of like a carrot, because it's a member of the carrot family. That's one of the distinguishing characteristics of this family, you know, the hemlock and the apicea family, the carrot family, is it has a taproot, so it's not going to be connected to all the other hemlocks around it. And do I have a picture? I don't think I have a picture. If you slice that root, that taproot in half, you'll see it actually has segments. It's hollow with segments, kind of like bamboo. If you imagine slicing bamboo in half, where you would have hollow segments along the length of the bamboo, that is how the taproot of the hemlock will look. So very, very, very distinct differences from elderberry. Uh, focusing on the teeth on the edge of the leaves and the very widely spaced flowers, the fact that it does not produce berries, and it has a smooth green stem with... Uh, purple stripes or potentially uh, splotches. Dennis, you might be able to put a tracker on the mouse pointer. Yeah, I think I'll figure that out uh, after we're done here tonight. Wow. Okay, 8.53. So that is the hemlock. That is the worst possible thing to mistake for uh, elderberry. Is, like I said, the flowers kind of look similar, but this can be deadly. It's one of those, you know, it's the last mistake you'll ever make sort of thing. Okay. Uh, last for this, where do you find it? 
really a lot of the same places you find elderberry. So like elderberry, it prefers full sun. It can handle partial shade. You are not going to find it in the deep woods. It's a big, fast-growing growing plant. Elderberry can get maybe 18 feet tall in a summer. Uh, hemlock, under ideal growing conditions where it has plenty of water and plenty of sunlight, it can get you know close to 12 feet tall. So really, really big, fast-growing plant here. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but this is in the ditch along the road. This is actually on the way to Four Notch uh, Loop Trail. So this is Four Notch Loop, uh, or no, Four Notch Road here up in the Sam Houston National Forest. So in the bottom of the ditches, in the wettest part of the ditches is where you're going to find the hemlock. Unlike elderberry, which likes being right next to water, but doesn't necessarily want to be in the water, the water hemlock is actually okay with being in the water on occasion. So, yes, uh, uh, Dion, yes, the hemlock produces a burr-type seed, uh, same as a celery seed or a fennel seed or a dill seed. It does not produce a berry. So wet stream banks, ditches, pond edges, uh, USDA map shows it kind of all over Texas and random spots. Uh, and again, if there are wet ditches or stock ponds or something like that, there's a chance that a seed might have ended up there in bird poop or anything like that. Wade, any decent non-edible uses for hemlock? If you are of a society that hates philosophers, it's a good way of getting rid of philosophers. If you remember... Uh, Socrates, 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 so so Socrates. I, I always fall back on the Bill and Ted uh, pronunciation of Socrates, and uh, that's how they put him to death because he was, you know, corrupting the youth. Dennis, yes, uh, hemlock does die back annually, so uh, it's a basically a one year plant. So in that year, it can grow, you know, nine, twelve feet tall. But then it dies in the winter, unless it's a very, very mild winter. Uh, but usually it will die back with the first frost. Yeah, but it was definitely, uh, there is no human use for this plant unless you are an assassin or something like that. So, yeah, uh, no good, not even for mulch or compost or anything like that. Wow. Okay, this is taking a lot longer to get through than I expected because I still have, let me see here, escape. Whoop. Ah, that's not what I want. Boom. Yeah, so I still have pokeweed. Oh, yeah. Just pokeweed and glossy privet to get through. So I guess next week, oops, bring this up here. So yeah, next week we will continue on with identification. And then uh, depending on how long that takes to go through the next two plants, and considering we've gone through three plants tonight uh, in the course of an hour, uh, maybe getting through the, the two plants, um, Maybe all we can do next week, maybe talk a little bit about some uses, um, or I'll just fill in with, you know, interpretive dance and things like that. <sighs> yeah, Elizabeth, I, I don't, well, often the difference between medicine and poison is dosage, but there are certain medications or certain plants that I, I'm not going to touch to each their own. But I personally do not feel comfortable enough in my skill level to use uh, hemlock as a poison. I don't need uh, hemlock as a medicine. I don't even uh, want to use pokeweed as a poison, as a medicine. <laughs> um, Kelly, apparently Native Americans found a way to use hemlock as a pesticide. That, that might be possible. I mean, it's an extremely poisonous plant. Okay, what time? Okay, 8.58. So, yeah, uh, I guess at this point, uh, we are coming close to the end. Uh, finish your drink if you have it. Mm, mm. Gin. Love me, gin. 
Um, oh, wow. Hillary, first time viewer from Seattle. Greetings, Hillary. You are now part of the tribe, which means you have all sorts of energy and good will flowing towards you from everyone else. If you liked what you saw tonight, be sure to tune in tomorrow for the Donut Shop at the Beginning of the World, my morning show, 7.30 to 8 a.m. Uh, Central Time, so Houston Time. Uh, and it's just uh, babbling about plants and movie stars and who knows what. I guess this morning we were talking about dogs and imitating Bigfoot, um, things like that. So... <laughs> But at this point, 8.59. Cool, Ruthie. Yep, see you at the donut shop. Gailey, thank you very much. You are very welcome. Uh, okay. Uh, who asked that? Uh, okay, Sue. Uh, interest, whoops, whoops, where'd you go, Sue? Let me throw this up there. Okay, Sue asked, did you say whether American elderberry is best or European, uh, European elderberry is okay? So both of them are the Sambucus Niger, but there are variations of that. Again, they're the, the European elderberry and the most common North American elderberry are, think of them as two different breeds of dogs. And so um, at a molecular level, they're damn near identical. So they are both really, really good. There might be some very subtle minor differences, but as far as between European and uh, American, nah, they're both good. So can I, whoops, how do I get rid of that here? Oop. Okay. Um, all right, cool. So next week I will have things set up a little better each time I'm learning. Uh, so, oh yeah, Charles, Juniper and Rosemary, good stuff. Um, <laughs> all right, gotta go, gotta return the house to the family. So love you all. See, hopefully most of you tomorrow at the donut shop at the beginning of the world. Until then, have a great night. Okay. Bye-bye.